There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Hey, everybody. It is time once again for another episode of the Your Mountain podcast. I am your host, David Wilms, and sitting... Let's start. Let's start with the guy with the golden voice, uh, Mike McGrady. What's up? How's it going? Never been better. How about you? Uh, I've been better. I have, but uh, I'm in pretty good shape. <laughs> <laughs> when have you been better? Um, uh, well, lots of times. <laughs> yeah. Why are you not better? It was just one of those days, you know. <laughs> I have to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> Is it because your wife came over and hung out with my wife for like five hours today? Um. She did spend a lot of time with your <laughs> wife today. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah. I got a lot of quality time with the kids, though, and that was good. That's so, good. So that's that doesn't make it a bad day. No, no. Yeah. My kids, my ki- I got two kids, and they decided that they wanted to take a 24-hour challenge, self-imposed, that they were going to stay in the basement of our house for 24 hours. And so they went and got food <laughs> and brought stuff down there. <laughs> And so we were like, okay, we'll 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 give you a cell phone, and you can text us if you you know have an emergency or something. And and it's been, can you bring down ice cream? <laughs> can you bring down popcorn? <laughs> so I think it's funny because when we were kids, something like that would have been a bell. Right? Yeah, right. We've been ringing exactly. a bell. Yeah. yeah. Now it's yeah. a cell phone that where, can text you. Where I grew up, being in the basement would have been goo goo goo. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Water. <laughs> nobody nobody had basements in Florida. Right? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Nephi. You just flew in tonight. Uh, I just flew in from Washington D.C. and boy, are my arms tired. Oh, oh, dun, come dun, on. dun 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 dun. Uh, I mean? really am tired. Yeah, no, it's showing. Hey, yeah, how's it going? I'm, it's good. I think it's. I'm tired. Are you ready to do this thing that we're about to do? Is it? Uh, is it a podcast? Yeah, I've been ready for like 45 minutes, and you've just been going over your notes again and again and again. Actually, not really. Like We've been arguing, Moses, <laughs> like Moses with the Ten Commandments, holding up his notes, and like I'm right. Should it be nine? Should it be eleven? Uh, what, uh, what's funny is we we spent the past 45 minutes arguing about no nothing way. that we're going to talk about on this podcast. <laughs> That's right. And I sat there. <laughs> you did. It's all true. It's all true. <laughs> it did happen that way. Oh, man. So you know what? What's that? I just want to say thanks, Greg. What do you want to say thanks, Greg, for? Greg, our listener, who's so dedicated to hunting and fishing that he is out there just slamming big game with his minivan. Or, I should say, from, from his minivan. minivan. Yeah. <laughs> so last last week, last week you... <laughs> I said, whoever... You put out a challenge. You put out yep. a challenge, a promotional challenge, right? Greg, you're the man. So you know, last week it was you know, the first person to send us a picture of themselves hunting from a minivan. Greg, you're the man with the minivan. And like, uh, it, it would get a it would get a federal premium belt buckle. It's right? on its way. And it's on its way. Uh, and Greg was the first one to send in a picture uh, of himself uh, hunting you know what? with like, a minivan. And, and had a great backstory behind it. And yeah. if you don't think this guy is serious, I mean, this guy is up. I mean, obviously... Obviously, Greg cares about his craft in terms of being a good hunter because he is listening to the Your Mountain podcast. I mean, this thing hits the ground at like midnight. And by 5 a.m., he's up on his typewriter in his minivan typing an email. Yeah, hot off the presses. Yeah. Well, plus, he lives in an area where, uh, I mean, if you're hunting... We're not going to tell you where... I'm not going to say where, but he lives in an area where... Let's just say uh, it, it shows the some, breadth... Uh, there's some fan base. There's well, there's some rug. I was gonna say there's some rugged country in this area. Some really rugged country in this area. Yeah, and he's he's able to to uh, he's able to get out with his kids. He's able to get out by himself. He's able to do a lot and out here, of a minivan. I, I got to tell you, I, when when he, he no wait 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 hold okay on. okay I want to interrupt you just because I know that Ryan Bronson hates it. Now go ahead. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> he probably will hate this. <laughs> no, but, he hates it when I interrupt you. Oh okay. No wait, let me interrupt. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, no wait. So we exchanged. No, so so Greg and I exchanged exchanged a couple emails, and I told him something, and I don't think I've told you guys this, uh, but I mean, maybe Mike knew. Yeah, yeah. In my in my early twenties, my first car was a Ford Taurus. 
So I did all of my hunting uh, until I met my wife, who brought with her to the relationship a Jeep. Uh, until I met her, I did all of my hunting out of my Ford Taurus. Mm-hmm. I had to replace the, the gas tank several times because I took it on two check roads, <laughs> and, I t- and I took rocks to the gas tank and cut it open. <laughs> had to walk out to get help um, multiple mm-hmm. times. I packed things out. I had animal parts like you couldn't imagine in the back of a Ford Taurus. Uh, and, you know, so, you know... Uh, you know, minivan, Ford Taurus, whatever it takes to get you into the field, we're just glad you do it, right? We just, you know, we encourage you in, by any means necessary to get out there and enjoy the great outdoors. Even if you have to marry a woman to get the appropriate vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> if like Dave, you like do. Dave did. <laughs> that's, that's a fact. Um, so, so here we are tonight. A couple of weeks ago, we did a podcast, and we kind of we ran through a bunch of the... Uh, uh, bunch of state legislatures and the and laws going on in, in state legislature. You're giving me a look like I missed something. No, I'm just gonna say what day is it? Oh yeah. Well I was gonna well, I'm gonna jump on that in one second. Oh okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna say Yeah. So we so we did this podcast a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we went through a bunch of hot topics in legislatures around the country, and we got to thinking, you know, as we're talking about what to do tonight, um, you know, we got we got to thinking, and we we often have a really heavy Western influence in our in our podcast for obvious reasons, you know, being based here and all all the issues we deal with in the West and the public lands issues, but there's are some things going on back east right now that are pretty significant for hunters that are hunting back east. And we know we've got listeners all over the country. And so we wanted to take a deep dive into to Nephi's point. We're sitting around a table right now in Studio 1A in Mike's basement um, on a Sunday, late Sunday evening. We wish we were hunting right now. We wish we were hunting right now, or we wish we'd been hunting earlier today. Which we could have been, Which we, If we could find something that was open right now. Which... We probably can. Squirrels and rabbits. Are they open right now? Uh, squirrels yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Another couple more weeks. I, I thought rabbits didn't open until March, but maybe they're open. Uh, anyway, oh, sidetrack. Uh, we have that opportunity here, right? If we want, as long as there's a season for some animal, you know, any animal that you can legally, lawfully pursue out here, we can do it any day of the week that the season's open. And as we learned a couple weeks ago, there are a number of states where that's not the case. Um, Where on Sundays, in particular, there are restrictions or all-out prohibitions on hunting. And so we thought, let's dive into that a little bit more. Let's talk about this Sunday hunting ban issue and sort of the the reasons behind it. Uh, We'll step back a little bit into the history of, of you know, how these came into being and, and take you to what's going on at the legislature right now and the mm-hmm. and the arguments on both sides of the issue so you can better understand why this is even a debate. Because I think for right. some of us out here in the West, we're like, how is this even a debate? Yeah, there's yeah, a I whole mean, host of people that have the blues and they just can't hunt on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about that. And Dave's an atheist, but he still believes in hunting. Oh, uh, you, on Sunday, uh, you're gonna get me stuttering here. I don't even know what to. How to not an atheist. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's. Uh, I'm okay. I'm gonna explain you what to I go with can, I, can I can I explain Mortholicism on this? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's another. Dave, that's another. That's another podcast. Dave's a hybrid. He's not an atheist. He's I, a hybrid. I, I'm a I'm a lifelong Mortholic. Uh, Anyway, we'll, we'll describe that on some other, <laughs> other podcast, right? Uh, so uh, let's talk about this a little bit. So this Sunday, Sunday hunting laws, this prohibition on Sunday hunting laws, are frequently called uh, blue laws, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and you can trace blue laws back. Uh, the very first, uh, just um, you know, kind of call it this Sunday legislation, the first time you saw it, 321 A.D., a right. long, long time ago, uh, which, which commanded, there was a uh, law, Constantine the Great passed this edict, commanding all judges and inhabitants of cities to rest on the day of the sun, which was, I guess, Sunday. Okay. <laughs> all right, I'm following. I'm, I'm, interpreting. Following I'm interpreting. Which is not the Sabbath. Yeah. Not necessarily the Sabbath. Right. That comes a little say, bit later. I want to get to, because yeah. that, but this is the, the first time it's... Right, it's mentioned the Sabbath being a different day. The Sabbath, you know, the right being 
you know, the, the first time that really came into being uh, was in 1676. And before I t- mention that, what that's all about, Nephi, I thought it was in Leviticus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, that's the thing. So, like, if we're going to go to that, we're going to go to yeah, Constantine I mean, if you're the Great. Go way back. Yeah. Then you've got to now go to like Judeo Christian, and because I mean, literally, it's on the cel- on the seventh day, thou shalt rest and do you know from all thy labors. And so that's been, yeah. and of course, it was you know that was. You know, we're talking thousands of years of that, and then right. you get to, so I mean, and then you get to a shift, <laughs> roughly when we switched from BC to AD, where some folks started practicing that differently on the first day versus the seventh day. So without going into the messy details of that, and yeah, so let's just fast forward past that one. Maybe I shouldn't have brought that one up. Yeah, no, let's that's just interesting, but though. In, it, let's but just say there's a lot context, of tradition right? in the background. But but let's go to to England. I feel really loud. Let's go to England. Am I too loud? And, no, you're okay. Oh, you're fine. Well, look, go well, fine then. So let's go to England in 1676. Okay. So this is the initial English law, which really it became the basis for virtually all of the Sunday closing legislation in the United States. And I'm not just, when I say Sunday closing, let's be clear. I'm not just talking about hunting. Uh, there, you know, in, in, over the course of U.S. history, uh, the blue laws don't refer to just hunting. That's kind of how we think of them today. But they refer to everything sure. from, uh, you know, businesses being open to sell things, a- drinking alcohol, um, yeah, you know, a, a whole host of things, right? Mm-hmm. Anything, anything on Sunday that's regulated, a commerce activity of some sort regulated, right? Uh, so here's what this law says, All right? So in eight, in 1676, for the better observation and keeping holy the Lord's day. All persons shall, shall on every Lord's Day apply themselves to the observation of the same by exercising the duties of uh, piety and true religion publicly and privately. Piety or piety? I might have misspelled it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and no tradesman, workman, laborer, or other person whatsoever shall do or exercise any worldly labor, business, or work of their ordinary callings upon the Lord's day or any part thereof, work of necessity and charity only accepted. So Hmm. we have this first law in 1676, and it's very, very clearly tied to Judeo-Christian beliefs, right? Very clearly tied to, you know, Sunday is the Lord's day, we don't do anything else on mm-hmm. the Lord's Day. That's the really the genesis of the laws as we know them in the United States. Yeah, that kind of explains too why, and even in modern times, the uh, uh, labor movement supports these types of things because of a prohibition on work uh, for at least a day of the week. Right. Yeah, makes sense. Right. Uh, so this became the the basis for a lot of the laws that we saw in the United States, the blue laws. Interesting side note, and I, so I, I was curious, I was curious, what, why are they called blue laws? Oh, I looked up the That's same thing. You looked up the same thing? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. I, I was looking it up. Did you come up with the same answer I did? Oh, I haven't heard your answer. Well, let's hear yours first then. Did you come up with an answer? No, there is no answer. So I came up with an answer, but there, it's a, it's a speculative answer because. Oh yeah, I saw because some of there's, those. Yeah. There's no answer. So. I think it's fair to put out the speculative answers. Sure, right? sure, why not? Yeah. So, w- by some accounts, it's referred to the blue wrapping uh, that accompanied printed documents in the late 18th century. Yeah, I I, I saw um, several articles debunking that type. I, <laughs> I said these were theories. Right? Yeah, no, no, I understand. Yeah. So, so yeah, I saw that perhaps it was originally printed on blue, um, and uh, that was debunked. Perhaps it was. Um, because the laws that w- uh, were put in a booklet, you know, it was a blue sort of leather binding or whatever, and that's basically been debunked. I think the the theory that I've seen most likely is the fact that uh, at some point in time, uh, the the folks that were most into uh, imposing morality uh, were called blue noses, and so the the blue the blue laws, so the you were a blue nose if you were one of those folks that just, you know, was always over the top at trying to go after somebody for what what they believed to be 
the right moral activity. And another take on that you know, was, I, I saw one that said that it was a mocking reference to the blue noses. to the blue noses, yeah, who were seeking to prevent you know indecent behavior like adultery, fornication. That's it. I didn't know that was indecent behavior. Yeah. Uh, hunting, <laughs> blasphemy, and drinking. And hunting. Hunting wasn't in the list of things that I saw, um, but certainly these other things were. Um, but hunting has been included. You know, blue laws have related to everything like housework and travel, uh, and limiting alcohol. Um, you know, basically, this idea of preserving Sunday as a day of rest. Uh, yeah. Anything you know. that prevents you from showing up at church. Yeah, well, right. our buddy Steve's talking. I mean, he mentioned this. They talked about this on a on a you know in a recent discussion, and you know the, this idea that you know there's something unholy about hunting. You know that was somehow dis- distracted from you know which Dave would argue since it basically is your religion. Pretty close to it. Yeah, which you know, hey, you know, like. But at that you know at that time, I, I think hunting was maybe served a different purpose than it does for a lot of people today. Uh, it was utilitarian. It was, you know, putting food on the table. It was part of your. Yeah. It was like work. It was like work, right? Yeah, it's yeah. just what you had to I mean, do on a day-to-day basis. We still we still put you know, we still put food on the table, but yeah. we have to be honest about it as well. It's not for a lot of folks. It's not cheap food, uh, <laughs> the, the way hunting is done today. Right. For a lot of folks, not for Dave, a lot of folks, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why I said a lot of folks. <laughs> um, but. But it, it, so these blue laws, uh, even though they've been around for hundreds of years, folks started really taking a look at them uh, in the 19th century. And you started to see a rise of in litigation, in challenges to these blue laws. You're questioning the constitutionality of them under the First Amendment. Uh, so the idea was under the First Amendment, the, the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, right, it prohibits what? It prohibits Essentially, the government will not on... establish a, a religion. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, the intermingling. Yeah, well, right. government won't establish a re- religion or promote a pre- specific religion. Separation right? of church and state. Yeah, respecting the, you know, prohibits any law that respecting the establishment of a religion. And so the arguments in front of the court were frequently that blue laws favored Christianity over other religions. Uh, and so this was litigated frequently uh, in lower courts. Ultimately, the... The U.S. Supreme Court weighed in on this in 1961, in this case of McGowan v. Maryland. Right? Mm-hmm. This wasn't a hunting case. Uh-huh. This was a case filed by employees of a department store. You know, and they were f- these employees were fined for selling merchandise on Sunday, which violated the state law in Maryland. In in Maryland. Yep. Right. And so it went all the way to the Supreme Court. What do you think the Supreme Court said? That's ah, fine. You can have those laws. This helps out because, you know, if we can have a rest for everybody, then um, then society's better off and, and uh, it's all good. It, basically, right? Yeah. I mean, it, so the, 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 the judge at the time, Chief Justice Earl Warren was the oh, one that yeah, wrote the, the opinion. Warren Court, yeah. Warren Court, right? Former Pretty governor. famous court, yeah. yep. Uh, so he wrote the opinion on this and said, the laws... These laws are permissible regulations under the state's police powers. Said that the state has the ability to do this in the interest of public health, safety, welfare, and morals. That right? fascinates me. And that, uh, and that all these regulations did was that they sought to provide a day of leisure and family, and, and that they did not impose a particular set of religious beliefs. You said it fascinates you. Yeah. Just because I wouldn't have anticipated the outcome. Yeah, I think. Well, you kind of should have because yeah. they're still around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they would have found them yeah, unconstitutional. They'd be gone. Then, then we wouldn't have them. <laughs> yeah. No, well, well, and I mean, I kind of thought that maybe, you know, imagining what would happen. I was like, oh, maybe this, you know, they have already tackled this thing on other areas because, of course, you know, it's not like I can't, it's not like people don't go to the mall on Sunday. And I'm not saying, and some people still make the choice not to. You know, I'm a, you know, people of faith will still say this is a day when we, you know, when we when we spend this day with our family, we spend this day at church, and even you know, hunters who are people of faith will say every you know fifty weeks of the year they're gonna on Sunday that's they're gonna be 
they're not going to be out in the field hunting. They're going to, you know, that's they're you know, hunting is the exception, Mm -hmm. not the rule on that day. And so that's, I mean, that's why I find it, I, I found it interesting. I just don't, you know, it's interesting. Like, can you imagine like a law against playing softball on Sunday? Where there's a not and again, like it does that does everybody need to go play softball on Sunday? No, but can you imagine? Oh you know, and I mean you still have businesses today. Chick fil A help us football. Right. Chick fil A is a good example of a business that mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. you know, it it's not open on Sundays. They they make that decision. Yeah, that's uh, great. But a personal decision. But it's a personal decision. You know, or in right? this it's case, not, a, a it's not a regulated a, decision. Yeah, it's a decision made by the ownership of that company. So a lot of these Sunday blue laws have over time over you know especially in in the twentieth century and the latter half of the twentieth century they stripped away right mm-hmm. and the two places and they're probably you, you know anybody's going to be able to point to some limited examples in other places, but the two instances where it seems like they they have hung around they've stuck around a lot longer than others are hunting. Pro- prohibitions on hunting mm-hmm. and prohibitions on alcohol sales. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are still a lot of states. As of a couple of years ago, it was still something like 30 or 32 states that had some sort of restrictions on Sunday sales. It might be, for alcohol, it might be uh, place opens a little bit later, can't stay open as late, only only can sell packaged liquor, bars aren't open, uh, you know, or, or it's state run liquor stores that aren't open on Sundays. So you, I mean, there, there are a lot of iterations on, on that. Uh, and so that's one place where it, it definitely seems to still be rather prevalent. Mm-hmm. And then the other place is on these prohibitions on Sunday hunting. Yeah, but not fishing. But not fishing. Yeah. Not fishing. Not recreational shooting. Right? Not, I mean, there's a... Yeah, and, it, and these groups, and these aren't... What's the right wording? I want to say not mutually exclusive. So that doesn't mean that if you don't, the fact that you don't like hunting on Sunday doesn't mean that you're in favor of not being able to buy alcohol on Sunday and vice versa. And that's kind of, it's just kind of interesting yeah. how like people's, what's crept into this is people's personal beliefs on other matters is really what's in many cases driving them to, you know, it, it no longer has anything to do, for example, the hunting issue in many cases with the fact that people don't, you know, that they think that you should be in church instead. A huge portion of those people, maybe even the majority of the people that don't want you hunting on Sunday really don't care if you're going to church because they're not. Yeah. I mean, there are still people out there making that argument, right? That you shouldn't hunt on Sunday because Mm -hmm. you should be going to church. Mm -hmm. But then what do you say to the person that's out mountain biking or fishing or Mm -hmm. climbing or doing Anything else. And that's right. And that's what's going funny. to a professional football game. Do I mean literally anything else. I mean we've talked about this a little bit, but some of those groups that are some of the people that are saying we shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't let people hunt on Sunday are actually the other recreationalists who want to be out there at the you know, using those lands at the yeah. exact same time. It is literally the mountain bikers who are out there that don't want you out hunting on Sunday because they're like, Hey, you know, this is the day we like to go mountain biking. And so if you're out there hunting, then, you know, even though there's no, I mean, there's, I mean, there's nothing to this argument in terms of a danger factor, but you know, still that's what there's, you know, some of those groups are saying. So let's get to that in one second. Cause I wanted to, I wanted to really quickly focus in on where we're talking geographically. Mm-hmm. So, so let's let's narrow this down on these Sunday hunting laws. You know, we are talking about it's not Utah. We're talking about the Eastern Seaboard. That's right. I mean, that's really what we're talking from about South Carolina up to Maine. All the states that have some sort of uh, that still have either complete prohibitions of for hunting on Sunday or some level of prohibition are all right there along the eastern seaboard, between, somewhere between South Carolina and Maine. Uh, it, nowhere else in the country that yeah. I can find. I mean, and that's just, I mean, and part of that, if you think about it, that's that's because of how these laws are so old that they literally are from colonial times. Yeah. They, they've, they have... The Puritans didn't settle uh, Utah. No. Right. Well, uh, some of the laws haven't been in, in place that long. I mean, I'm looking at 
like North Carolina's law, right? Was put in place. It was in place in 1868. Yeah. 1868. <laughs> what about Pennsylvania's? Um, I'm just you know, curious. Yeah, I don't know if I know when Pennsylvania was put put well, in you place. Should have. Well, you you call me out on something like that, and I probably should. Well, have you had it. North Carolina. I did it randomly, but North and North Carolina's. Uh, the reason I had North Carolina's is because North Carolina actually in in 2017, uh, they actually act, enacted a lot of legalized Sunday hunting on public lands. They did, uh, but. Uh, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission has yet to propose any rules yet allowing uh, hunting on Sunday. So the the legislature authorized the commission to do it, allowed the commission to do this, and then they they haven't done it yeah, yet. Yeah, they didn't tell and them to do it. They just said you can. So now if the you com- want. so now the commission is looking at doing uh, you know, public uh, you know, public uh, public meetings yeah. and hearings to gather input on whether or not to have. Uh, Sunday hunting in North Carolina. So it's legal, but it actually hasn't been allowed yet, there's, near there's as a, I can tell. There's a guy out there whose initials are TS, and if you like the idea of being able to hunt in North Carolina, go buy that guy a beer. <laughs> who, thank him later. Trevor, you know who you are. <laughs> uh, anyway, so Pennsylvania, I don't know when Pennsylvania's law came on the books. Uh, but... But, but the don't point buy is, him a beer on Sunday if it's illegal. Just so we're clear, right? Yeah. right. But but just so we know, I mean, uh, it, the laws have been around for a long time, yep. right? Uh, whether it's colonial times or 150 years ago or 130 years ago, they've been around for a long time. Uh, and so, yeah, let's let's talk about first of all, so we know why they were put in place in the first place. But why are they still in place today? There's a number of reasons. Let's hear some of them. Well, first of all, let's just say it's a challenging issue. Yeah. <laughs> let's get that out. You got to get that in there, right? We've all got to come together. It's a challenging issue. Well, I, I guess I, let me I just say that I have a problem with them and that personally for me, they 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 would impose impediments to, to hunting because I'm... Um, you know, I'm not hunting during the week very yeah. often. You work. And I can vouch yeah, for that. I Every work. time I try and talk you into taking a day off to hunt. Oh, like, I know. Yeah, that's so. So think about that. it. Like, norm- You're not like normally, Dave. I'm hunting. I'm hunting weekends. If I'm lucky, um, I'm hunting a good. You know, some shoulder days on the end of that. So, just one Sunday prohibition knocks out at least a third or a quarter of my hunting time, and and I can tell you that during the week my kids are in school. Yeah. And I'm not taking them out of school to go hunting at this point. For a lot of people. Um, yeah. And so and so that cuts off half of the days that I can take yeah. my kids for the purposes of recruitment, you know, and and those types of things. So that that's a significant yeah. impediment. Well, I think I saw where the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation believed that, you know, the, these types of laws have the impact on about 100,000 hunters that are like, forget it. You know, I'm not. I'm not doing that. Um, like, like and, if these laws didn't exist, we'd have a hundred thousand more hunters out there. Is that uh, what you? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the the study I saw it wasn't very clear on what they were trying to articulate on on, but it, but it basically they were able to quantify that there are a lot of people that these are problems for them and their and their ability these individuals to get out and hunt, and so that is causing a, a you know an actual quantifiable impact. As of 2017, if we took eight states with limits or outright bans on hunt, Sunday hunting, if they were going to eliminate those restrictions and allow hunting on all Sundays within the dates of current hunting seasons, the estimates are estimates are about that's worth about 27,000 new jobs created, um, roughly 730 million dollars in wages, about 2.2 billion dollars in additional economic activity to those states. Now, so so one of the counters I've heard to that. So you said two point two billion dollars in economic in additional activity? economic activity in those states. Because remember, what you're talking about it's not just those days. Because we're not just taking the numbers of hunters for those days and saying double that. The other thing that you have to consider is that in a lot of locations, if people are choosing to go somewhere and hunt, let's like say, you know, for us, we're gonna we're gonna put together a trip. We're gonna go someplace um, for a weekend and hunt. You're not going to those states. You're going to a neighboring state, whether you live in that state or not, because chances are pretty good if you can only go, you know, if you're taking your weekend to go hunt, you're going to go hunt one day or you can go someplace you can hunt two days. And so 
it's 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 opportunity cost. It's not just you know doubling the people that hunt. It's it's opportunity cost in tourism dollars. It's money spent at hotels. It's money spent for gas. Yeah. It's all those things that come into planning a hunting trip. So let me ask you a question. Um, I might I might know the answers. You, no, and this might this might be a question that there that there is no answer for. But one, as I was looking into this, diving into this a little bit more. One of the arguments that I saw, and it's one that you already brought up, one of the arguments that I saw against lifting the ban, you know, so in opposition to lifting this Sunday ban, was from other outdoor recreationists, right, suggesting that you know, that one day of the year or that one day of the week is um, because there is no hunting, that's why they go out and bike or hike or do wildlife photography or you know do you know, whatever these activities happen to be. Well, would that be true well, if it was a Wednesday? No, but here's here's my point. Here's my point. So that that's the argument they're making is you know, they're saying the same thing. They're saying I only recreate. I work during the week. I only recreate on the weekends, and that's my day. And if there are people in the field, I'm not going to go that day. Yeah. And one of the pieces that from the economic piece that they point out, and I haven't seen any data to back this up, which is why I'm asking the question is that uh, one piece of data I have seen, at least in most of these states that have the Sunday hunting ban, the outdoor recreation economy without hunting is significantly larger, the impact on jobs and uh, dollars on the economy from that segment of outdoor recreation is significantly greater than that of hunting and would not be you know, allowing Sunday hunting would not close that gap in any measurable way. And yeah. th- so the question I have is knowing that is factually true it is from an economic standpoint, would, would you see a noticeable by allowing Sunday hunting and having this increase of 2.2 billion added to the economy, would you have an even larger, amount of economic activity removed from it from no. other outdoor recreationists that now won't go out on a Sunday. No. I mean, that's uh, uh, laughable, I would say. And here's why I was... But I do you have any data on that? Or are you no, just... Neither is this, do, and neither do they. I, and, and I don't know that they do either. No, they I, don't. I'm just asking. So this is... this is. I just want to be no, clear before you me, start this. This is opinion, right? Yeah, but yeah. Here, and here's why I say that. I mean, theirs is only opinion too. So somebody's saying... I mean, somebody's saying that there's a lot of assumptions going in there. So people saying that like suddenly they're not going to go recreate because they know that it's legal to hunt. Do they even know when hunting season is? Do they know like, do you really, I mean, anybody here find that credible that there are people out there who are going, well, you know, I would go on a mountain bike ride today, but when did deer hunt start? Well, I can't go mountain bike hunting. I'm not going to question that there are some people that are uncomfortable enough with, and as a hunter, I need to be respectful of this, that there are people out there that um, are uncomfortable enough with the idea of uh, there being um, guns fired in the woods while they are in them as well, uh, that they might not go out there. I, I don't think that number is a very high number. I think there are people that would say, here's when hunting season is. I'm not going to go into the woods during that time because it makes me uncomfortable. And I respect that. And I understand where they might be coming from, especially if they haven't been exposed to the culture we've been exposed to our entire lives. Right. You're talking about folks that might be coming from an urban environment that have never been exposed to hunting and, and the thought of being out there and knowing that there are armed people in the woods, Mm -hmm. um, chasing wildlife and shooting wildlife that probably would make them uncomfortable. I I respect that. I do believe that that number is probably a small percentage of the overall well, recreation well, economy. Well, it definitely should be. I mean, I think it's la- – it, it, it truly to me is – is there needs to be some people looking at what they would like. Uh, I mean, how fair is that? I, I'm i trying to find a nice way to say this because – and I don't know that there is one to say, okay, um, you're telling me that – three days out of the year because these states that we're looking at it's not like these states that we're looking at have these huge it's not like you're in wyoming where you're hunting elk from august until january all the time i mean you're looking at states where some of these states where it's pretty restrictive anyway there isn't a whole lot of opportunity for hunting in the first place and so 
you're telling me now that you like those two days, like all these other recreationists are going to be like, you know what? I really don't like the idea that you're going to give two days of my 365 that I could be out wandering around and you're going to let a hunter wander out there for two. We can't even, oh, you're ruining my recreational experience. I mean, people, come on. Like that is, that's, uh, it's not reasonable. If we take that same argument and we start applying it across uh, and again, now let's get rid of hunting and let's start thinking about all the other things that scare me and that make me not want to go into the, I mean, you're really just starting to bifurcate. You know, we talk about the, the, the need to get away from hyphenated hunting. I mean, you really are starting to get into the realm of selfishness in the great outdoors. That's not reasonable. And not only is it not reasonable, I mean, you say it's okay. I mean, okay, uh, I'm not, somebody, I'm... somebody go ahead and get freaked out about that. But the stats, the numbers like they, 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 it is truly not there. So the fact that somebody watched deliverance and the canoeists now are scared of people in the woods, that's great. I'm glad you've taken your mind there, but the reality is there is not a danger on the ground. Well, so yeah. And it's, it's, it's fine to point out that, and I think so it's now that I'll get off my, yeah, so I think well. it's fine to point out the, the safety piece. All I was trying to say is, look, I recognize that there are people that are, that have not been exposed to the hunting culture, uh, heritage, yeah. the, the, you know, that, whole, you know, everything that we've been about that we've been exposed to our whole lives. So I recognize that and I can appreciate that it makes some people uncomfortable. I, I am willing to recognize that, but, but I, I think it is, it's also true what you've said that the, the risks of injury, uh, let's just say if you're a mountain biker, you're, you are probably far more likely yeah, we're doing to you. severely <laughs> severely hurt yourself yeah. launching over your handlebars, you hitting a, big... a rock funny, <laughs> than you are to have a bad encounter with a hunter in, in the woods. We're doing you a big favor by keeping you out of the woods. We're making you much safer. <laughs> no, this brings up a point that we talked about actually before the podcast. This is a great opportunity to talk about it. There is a need for us to, to be understanding as as users in the great outdoors, hunters or somebody else, whatever you use may be, there's a need for empathy. There's a need for us to try and understand. I mean, it, it's the, it's the right thing to do is to try and understand where other people are coming from to try and understand their concerns, their argument, you know, why something scares them, why they might be nervous about it. But it's also our response, you know, I don't, it's our responsibility to find, to, to work, to find a, a, um, to educate. respectful way to educate, not an argumentative way, not yelling them down and telling them they're dumb, but to, but to find a way to open the door and bring them in and, and, and share our world with them because really it's misinformation that makes people scared about these things. And it's not just this issue. There are, there are, uh, 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 a number of issues associated with, you know, hunting. There are a number of issues associated with other outdoor sports where people, you know, they just, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, ignorance, you know, can, can leave people in a, in a location where they, where they don't have the understanding of these things to be able to have, you know, to understand the argument that we're going to bring to the table. And so, if we just shout those people down, like you do to me sometimes, Dave. I, I believe I was on the receiving end of a lot of the shouting before this podcast. <laughs> so then, then, then we, you know, we lose that opportunity. They're never going to be brought into the community. They're never going to be advocates. And, you know, and we see this a lot. You know, we talk about this concept, and I think we're going to talk about it again in, in the future, but this concept of moving past partisan. And, that it, and it's more than just like, you know, there's a, a, a left, you know, maybe Democrats and Republicans have different ideas about stuff. A lot of it's just, you know, culturally where people come from, they have different ideas about a lot of stuff. And if we ever hope to find this common ground that we talk about being so important, we have to find a way to kind of put our biases in the back seat and try and understand where other people are coming from. If we're going to find that, you know, those common spaces. I agree with you. I think we want to talk about that more some other time. Some other time for but, sure. But it applies but to Sunday it does, hunting. No, it does apply to Sunday hunting. Um, but with the the limited time we've got left, you know, we've we've talked, we've we've just touched on a couple of things. But but one thing that I think we really need to touch on because 
there are Sunday hunting laws. Uh, they're, they're bill running through Pennsylvania right now, right? Which is a huge lift. The fact that somebody was able to get that bill out of committee in Pennsylvania, if you care about this issue, you don't get this opportunity very often. Right. But let's talk about, uh, so there's, there's one piece of this that we haven't talked about that I think warrants a, a, a special level of, of conversation. So we've talked about the other, uh, other recreational users and this idea of safety. And, you know, you know, you've, we've, I think we've all kind of pointed out that look, we, we empathize, but at, at the same time, hunting is much safer than riding a bike. Hunting is, it's very <laughs> safe. Right. And, and yeah. And we've talked yeah. about the economic benefits. Um, one thing I've noticed in a number of States and it's something that we're we're cognizant of in the West, but we maybe don't have to deal with as much because we have so much public land, right? Is the hunter private landowner interface relationship that is so paramount to being able to have access, you know, an opportunity in the East mm -hmm. because so much of the land in the East is privately held. Uh, and, and in so many instances, the only opportunity that somebody might have to hunt is if they have access on private land, whereas out here we have what feels like limitless public land opportunities, right? So we're, we got to look at that side of it. And at least in Pennsylvania, I know in Maine, in, in actually in several of the states, one of the arguments against, in fact, one of the most vocal opponents of lifting the Sunday hunting ban, are landowners, right? And so first of all, why is that? Well, Dave, there are a lot of different reasons that we could <laughs> speculate on. I don't think it's... Spe why I mean, do it's, you think that is? I'm not, and I'm not speculating. I'm looking at, at statements that they make, right? And I think it depends on the state, right? It, it, it varies slightly from state to state, right? But, yeah, not not wanting to have to deal with someone knocking on the door and, you know, give them a break on them one day a week. Sure. Of people coming and saying, hey, can I hunt? Right. Which yeah, right. is an interesting one because in many, many cases, you can hunt on private lands on Sundays. That's a fact. That is a fact. So well, it's interesting that that's one of the... But let, me, let, me, let, me, let me highlight Maine in particular. Yes. Uh, and, and I know we still want to do a podcast almost specifically on Maine because the access... The main access laws are so interesting. And I'm still just touching the surface of them, so I'll probably mess this up a little bit. Uh, but Maine is largely, well, not largely, Maine is a fence-out state, meaning that in order to prevent, if if you want to keep somebody from coming onto your private land and hunting, you need to post that property and say, this private property, you need to ask permission to be here, right? My understanding is that the in Maine the vast majority of landowners do not post and and folks there's there's almost an unwritten rule that you can um, because it's not posted you can hunt there and so a lot of the access a lot of the hunting opportunities are on unposted private lands and the landowners are fine with that and part of the reason they're fine with that is because at least one day a week they're going to have the place to themselves Sunday right and so the idea is you know, in a state like Maine, if you were to pass a law that opened up hunting on Sunday, theoretically, and we don't know if this would happen in practice because it's never happened in Maine, right? Because they haven't changed these laws. But theoretically, the landowner community could say, okay, no more access, right? In a state where almost everything is dependent on having access to private land, if you lift the Sunday prohibition, it has the potential, because landowners are so opposed to that, of actually reducing access and opportunity. So that, by adding one more day, you may actually reduce opportunity, is, yeah. is the argument made. That's an argument, that but state. is it a legitimate counselor, fear? It's, counselor, what do you think of that? I, I want to, so I, I, not I'm you not going to, well, you counselor. really quickly, I'm not well, going to say. I'm interrupting I, you because mine hates it. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to say whether, I'm not going to say, let you say if, it, if you think it is. I'm not going to say whether it's a legitimate fear or not. Because I haven't been able to dive into um, the politics of Maine enough to know. Right. I mean, I've just scratched the surface, so I can't pretend to know. I have a very outsider looking in perspective. I'd like to reach out to some folks from Maine and get their perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps bring them on to this podcast and have a conversation about that to get a, a better sense wow. of whether that's a, a real fear. It's, it, well, it seems as though... 
um, like many things, the fear of the unknown is the problem. And I mean, and, until you actually lifted the ban, I mean, how would you know for sure what was going to happen? And I, I just have a hard time believing that that would play out the way that they're fearing. Well, I mean, it's going to, I would say that you want to know how it's going to, it's going to be across the board. So some people are going to, it's going to make some people are going to respond by saying, well, now, now I don't want to let anybody on. And some people are probably do that already. And some people aren't going to care and it's not going to make a difference. So I think this idea that you're going to have the an entire community of landowners, you know, uh, change at once. I, I don't know that that's a yeah, I mean, legit if the, argument. Like I said, the cultural ethos of the area is that I'm is not that going to... Snap your fingers. Yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm going to allow folks to kind of come on and hunt, and I'm, I'm not going to buy into this. I'm going to post that's just being a jerk as a neighbor. Um, and then suddenly we, we've got a change in the laws, and then everybody's going to suddenly fence out and post and, It'll run and do gamut. all those things. It'll, 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 there could be individual things, but it doesn't seem like something that would be a wave of emotion around it to say, that's it, we're done. I, like I said, I refuse to speculate on this one because I don't know the dynamics on the ground. I don't either, uh, but it just seems, I mean, human dynamics being what it is, it seems like it's not enough to be the, the tipping point that suddenly Maine just has a watershed moment of total change in how they handle so, it. But, but, here's but currently, the, here's Maine, the f- currently Maine is no Sunday hunting. None whatsoever of any kind. No no Sunday yeah. hunting at so, all. <laughs> and so it's, it's it, I mean, that's, so that's kind of the extreme when you're like example. The landowner's gonna, I mean, here's one of the things that I would counter with. So this idea that like there's at least one day when the landowner has it all to themselves. If you're a landowner and you don't like hunting in Maine, you don't want it in your land, you're probably posting it now. And the other thing that I would say is, you know, I could understand the argument where if you were a landowner, you wouldn't like him or if as a landowner, if I could know that I had my land to myself one day a week when only I can hunt it, that might be one thing. But, yeah, but that landowner but could not. have it all to himself seven days a week if they posted. That's true. And and fenced out, right? It's true. I, I'm just posing posing it this way, right? In that in Maine, and I suspect the same as in Pennsylvania. Um, maybe not, though. I don't know. Uh, the the hunting community is of of as far as of the overall population is a small percentage of the overall population. You bet. Right. Um, and the relationship between the hunting community and the landowner community is so vital in every state for purposes of states being able to conduct effective wildlife management. Uh, it, and in order to protect hunting heritage generally, landowners are critically important in, been, in you know, being a voice for that and, and providing opportunity. And so to the extent that it does upset landowners... You, that's a voice that has to be listened to. Oh yeah, I agree with I mean, that. That's a, and you have to yeah. figure out. And and so maybe it's maybe it's you know if you're going to go down this road of of um, of opening up hunting on Sundays, maybe there have to be certain concessions made to landowners. You know, certain things. You know, in, incentives. Like per- you could post your land, and people wouldn't be able to go in there and hunt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or <laughs> or but it might be things like enhanced trespass fees if they do. Right. So I think you what know, Dave is saying, though, is that it, it sounds like it may not be worth risking um, see, because of the net the the need to have those those private landowners. My understanding is in yeah. Maine that is one of the reasons why it not only doesn't yeah. get a lot of traction. There aren't a lot of bills that are introduced trying I, to gain traction. Yeah. No, so, I've lived in a lot of places where there's some social issue that. You know, it's just the way it is, and um, there's a variety of factors involved, and, and no one wants so I am to, th- to slay the sacred cow, whatever it is, yeah. right? And and maybe that's it for Maine. I don't know. I'm going to play devil's advocate here because I, I get that, you know, saying that argument is like, yeah, well, what if this is what's going on and we need to consider this? I think uh, realizing that there are other things that need to be brought up too which is that there are people who would use an argument like that, which as you're making this argument, you're saying that maybe this is the issue would say like, that seems reasonable, but there are other groups that are again, way more passionate about not having Sunday hunting that would use that argument where, when they really don't care about that, that's really not the issue. So humane like society, humane, I was of America say the humane society is a perfect would example. Would tell you like, wow, this is about, you know, this, this, you know, 
this, you know, respecting other people, you know, in the woods and, and the landowner. And, you know, that's just not true. That's not the real reason. I mean, the real reason is that they do, they, you know, they just don't want to see hunting at all. Is it fair um, to say that that we've uh, science has essentially debunked the concept that Sunday is necessary for a day of rest for population management? Oh, yeah, because you have the North American model and, and yeah, you have, yeah. you know, wildlife agencies we can just, respond to, I mean, yeah, we you just, can manage we time in the field, you can change the dates of seasons, yeah. you can change quotas, we haven't covered all sorts that of things. on thing, this episode, and, and it has been thrown out there before, but I just, so I thought I would just cover the fact that that's, yeah. that's not an actual viable that's, reason not to have one. That's right, and states that have gone from having hunting bans on Sunday to lifting those bans... Mm-hmm. You, that's been borne out. Like there, there's been no measurable change in in population dynamics, or okay. you know that sort of thing. Now, I, think, I, I think that science is is pretty solid. I do want to come seriously full circle. I know we've been long on this, but we started this out, and one of the things Mike mentioned was recruitment. So let's just touch this quickly and to think about it. For those people that are saying you know, these thoughts and concerns about hunting, the numbers of hunters in this country. You know, we're seeing these things go down. Mm -hmm. This is not a problem where we're getting more and more people in the woods hunting. And unfortunately, a fact of this is Sunday hunting. The people that are going out there hunting on the weekends are people who are working during the week. They are parents. Weekend warrior. They are parents with kids. They are the new hunters. When you see, and unfortunately, like, Let's be honest, the people who can afford to take the time off during the week are people who are, you know, they are the people who have been hunting longer. They're the people who are more invested in it. And there's a certain amount of selfishness here, too, for those people who would like to keep this honestly to themselves. And if we want to see hunting grow, if we want to see a future of this, you know, while respecting, again, where everybody else is coming from, We need to get out there and try and create opportunities for as many people as we can to get out there and participate in hunting. That's why this is so critical. You know, we we really have to move away from the thought that, well, I can go out on Thursday and Friday and take a couple days off work with, you know, me and Dave can. Who cares about Mike with his little kid who wants to go out there on the weekend? I want more geese for me. You know, I want more deer for me. I don't want Mike out in the woods, you know, chasing my deer around on the weekend. I mean, it's no different than the mountain biker. And unfortunately, we have people doing that in our own community, in our hunting community, who are selfishly trying to keep these opportunities from themselves. And you know what? If, if that's what, gosh, I think we really, you need to take a look at yourself. If you care more about yourself and you care about the future of hunting and the shooting sports, I mean, basically what you're saying is, I mean, and, and it's not just, I mean, you, you're hurting the future of the habitat. You're hurting the future of the animals. You're hurting the future of the North American model. You need to, you need to open this up. You Man. need to take a buddy hunting. <laughs> you need to try and get people out there. Dave, you need to share your secret spot. You keep coming back to this, and you know that's not going to happen. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the the most of that was the honest. heartfelt honesty, the, last the sincerity there. <laughs> um, it's not going to get me to change my mind on uh, giving yeah, up my spot. Nobody wants to hunt there anymore. Uh, but I mean, one thing I'd I'd point out is you seem more impassioned on this particular issue than anything we've talked about on about any other issue on this uh, podcast. We normally try not to take uh, real strong positions one way or the other, and you seem to come out you've. You've come out pretty strong in one thing. It's important. Sharing, I mean, we all agree on this. And and while the details, sharing this is important. Sharing this is important. And that's what I'd say. And we dance around a lot of these issues. But any time that we're trying to figure out ways to fence other people out of this opportunity, like, it's the, it is, I mean, and I will get on my moral sort, but it's the wrong thing to do. Well, let's just, I mean, let's get back to recruitment and retention. One last thing here. I mean, because... People leave, either leave uh, hunting for a lot of reasons, or they don't come into them for a lot of reasons. But one of the big reasons, one of the big reasons that people stop hunting or don't get into it is because of lack of opportunity and lack of access. And yep. sometimes access and opportunity are, are tied one in the same. And, and when and circling all the way back to what Mike said about taking his daughter out, you know, if, if you're opportunity 
is really limited to being able to go two days a week, are you going to spend the money that it takes? And it, you know, I, I joke about being able to go out pretty cheaply, but hunting is not a cheap activity to participate in, right? And if you're going to go out and pursue something, are you going to do, are you going to spend all that money and do all that preparation to be able to go out one day a week for a couple of weeks? Uh, I mean, and some people might say, well, you're going to take it from one day a week to two days a week. That matters. That does. Oh, yeah. Having that yeah. extra time, it, it matters. It's enough to potentially reactivate a bunch of more it, hunters that, that walked away. Doubling right. your opportunity in the field. Right. Yeah. Right. And so it it is, it, yeah, it, it's a big deal. It's a big deal that in Pennsylvania, uh, it, it, you, they've moved it out of committee. Now, there's, I think there's also legislation in Maryland, right? Uh, yep. Uh, and so you've got two states looking at it right now. Uh, there are a number of other states that still ban it. Um, but, you know, every year sort of layers of that onion are peeled away and, and the restrictions are laxed in, in many places. We might get to the place at some at point at some point where we don't have Sunday uh, restrictions anymore. For now, we still do. If you live in one of those states, we'd be interested in hearing your... Kyle in Maryland is on it. You keep it well, up, Kyle. Well, if you're in one of these states that that have uh, Sunday, Sunday hunting bans, we'd be interested in in uh, knowing... We'd be interested in hearing from you. We'd want to know, you know, what are your thoughts on it? You know, if you support it, if you're a hunter and you support the ban, uh, let us know why. We're, I mean... This is this is sort of new stuff for us. We're we're not exposed to this as much because we're out here where we have these opportunities to do it all the time. Let us know your opinions. Send us an email at uh, at your mountain at itsyourmountain dot com. Uh, find us on social media. Give a post uh, at uh, at the handles of at it's your mountain. Dave will uh, respond to that email too. Yeah, I will. Um, yeah, let us let us know. I mean, we're I mean we're genuinely curious what your thoughts are. If you're in one of these states, what are your thoughts on on Sunday hunting bans? Uh, and follow follow Pennsylvania closely, follow Maryland closely, um, and you know we'll we'll keep you posted. We'll see what happens with it. Um, maybe if it's lifted, we'll find an excuse to go out there uh, for a, for a weekend uh, yeah, right. weekend hunt somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and maybe we'll reactivate somebody that's out there that wants that's to get right. out and hunt. Um, That'd be good. So, do uh, you guys have anything else you want to add on this? No, just, but, uh, you know, Nephi's got a pretty mouth. That's all I know. Yeah. That's one of the most that's disturbing weird. things he's <laughs> ever really said to me. bizarre. <laughs> like, it's, one of the, it's an unusual thing to say. Well, he brought up deliverance. Ah, oh, there it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, back. Oh man, neither one of us picked up on no, that reference. No, I didn't. It was, well I just figured played. it was Mike. I mean, so you said Mike being creepy. That it just seemed like Mike being creepy. Well played, yeah. Mister McGrady. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'd leave it with to steal a line from Nephi. It is complicated. <laughs> I no, mean, no, this, it's challenging. This, it, challenging. It's dang challenging. it! Dang it! Dang it! Yeah, it's complicated too. Uh, but yeah, it is. It's challenging. You got anything else you want to add, Nephi? No. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a lot silence. of guys walk into a bar jokes this uh, this weekend. Yeah. So those probably uh, aren't so appropriate for this. Ready? All right. So a uh, uh, a horse walks into a bar. Bartender says, "Why the long the, face?" And the bartender. <laughs> Sorry, the <laughs> and the bartender looks at him and points at him and says, Hey, and then the horse says, You must have been reading my mind. Ah. Well, that seems like the best way we can possibly leave this, uh, <laughs> which isn't saying a lot. <laughs> Uh, but but anyway, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. If you got suggestions for uh, future podcasts, future deep dives on some of these topics, let us know. Uh, and until then, just remember that life is about experiences, so go have one.